You know, we've all heard that global warming is destroying the environment, right? And that if we don't do something about it quickly, we're facing potential disaster. Well, that's the cheery version of the story. Wait till you hear what James Lovelock has to say. Lovelock is what you call an independent scientist. Some would say a maverick. He actually works in a lab that used to be a barn in Cornwall, England. And for years, he's been sounding the alarm on climate change. Back in the 60s, Lovelock started preaching what is now called the Gaia theory, named after Gaia, Greek goddess of Earth. Basically, he says the Earth is one giant interdependent living system that regulates itself. It keeps chemical levels, temperature, and other conditions optimal to keep life going. And then we, humans, come into the picture. We cut down the trees, we spew out pollutants, and the system is thrown completely out of whack. Lovelock says, look, we can't undo the damage we've done. And by the end of this century, he predicts that many places on Earth will be unlivable and most of the human race will be wiped out. So don't waste your time trying to reverse climate change. He said, instead, focus on finding ways to survive the inevitable ahead. He lays it all out in his new book called The Vanishing Face of Gaia. Everybody, please say hello to James Lovelock. It's, it's such a fascinating uh, uh, theory that you have, and, but before we get into all the details of it, I mean, tell me, how did you come up with the theory of Gaia? Oh, well, it, it, it originated at the Jet Propulsion Labs in California a long time ago, 1965. But the name Gaia was given to me by a famous author, you probably know of him, uh, Bill Golding. Uh, Lord, he, of Lord of the Flies, that's right, and a whole series of other books. And I think he even got a Nobel Prize for literature in the end. Yes. So he just said, hey, you should call it. Like, how did that happen? Mm, well, you see, he was originally trained as a physicist. Most people don't know that, mm -hmm. but he was. And he and I lived in the same small village in England. There's only 400 people there. And we used to chat in the village pub. And uh, <laughs> he was interested in what I was doing over there in California. And when I told him I got this idea that the whole planet was looked after itself, with it, almost in a way alive, he said, well, you better give it a proper name. And I suggest you call it Gaia. And we went on talking for 20 minutes because I thought he meant G-Y-R-E, right. one of these great self-regulating worlds. He said, no, 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 I mean Gaia, the Greek goddess, the goddess of the earth. Now, does it, did that idea come up early in the pub conversation or much later when we have different... <laughs> when, when we've... <laughs> When things have changed. Well, that'll be telling. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're right. So the idea of the, uh, and, uh, of the world that regulates itself, the planet that regulates itself is one thing, but now we're at this point, and one thing we had talked about is you say it's too late. Like, this is, we just need to deal with the inevitability. Just for people who perhaps haven't wrapped their head around it, what is your theory that says we're done? It's not so much a theory. It's coming from observations of what's happening around the Earth. And it's always important observations are much more important than theories. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of theories. Now, uh, the Earth's been looking after itself for quite a while in the, what's called the interglacial, the kind of warm period we're in at the moment. But in the last few years, it started warming up. And this is a sign that it's moving away from the current state it's in to it exists in stable states, either cold, middling, or very hot. And it looks as if it's going to the very hot period. And it's been there many times before. Mm -hmm. And so, how long does it take to get to the place where we can no longer... Like, are you saying that... You're not saying the entire human race will be wiped out, but you're saying Heavens, that... Heavens, no, no. But a significant number. You're not talking about a party here. I'm afraid so. As many as seven out of eight are likely to be wiped out, yes. Is it certain parts of the globe that are going to be harder hit than others? Very much so. And Canada is unusually favoured. Um, this is the sort of place, when it happened before, 55 million years ago, life not only survived, but things moved here to, to get away from the heat. Mm -hmm. And that's likely to happen again. But this time it'll be people moving. And I think the main problem for Canada will be how to handle the influx of people from outside the world and when to be able to say, no, we've got enough now, if we take any more, we can't feed you. Now, the observation can sort of... You can monitor what's happening to, to the environment. You could take a look at, you know, melting, uh, you know, peaks of ice, I guess, around the world. But how, how, do, how do you prove that it is more than that? Like, how do you say that this is what happened 55 million years ago? How would you get to that place? 
Well, the evidence for the 55 million years ago comes from record of sediments and looking back over the evidence, and it's pretty solid. It's like, you know, they use the ice cores from Greenland or Antarctica, and you can tell what the temperature and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was any time up to a million years ago, indeed a lot longer than that. And it's that sort of evidence that, that, that is pointing to the changes that are taking place now as rather like changes that have happened in the past that are similar. Is this something that, with your observation, you can say is because of humans? You know, that's one of the big debates. Well, climate change is humans are causing this. Is, is this just an inevitability? Eh? The best way to look at it is, I think, think of yourself as somebody walking in a, in a forest somewhere and you pick up a gun and you accidentally pull the trigger and it goes off and does some damage. Uh, you didn't intend to do that, you, you kind of pulled the trigger by accident and that's what we've done. We pulled a trigger on the system and the system is now moving into another state. So let's say like in centuries and centuries from now this could have happened anyway but we've just kick-started the process. Exactly. Wow. So that means then that we should have a really good time, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it won't be all bad. No. There'll be some exciting moments, I think. For sure. Is it reversible? No, it isn't. That, that's, the, that's the crooks of it. I think a lot of people around the world, particularly politicians, the people who have the Kyoto meeting, the Bali meeting, they think that if we, we're good and we stop burning fuels and everything, it'll all go back to where it was. It won't. Can we slow Once it started moving, you can't stop it. Can we slow it down? I wouldn't say we can't, but I, I don't think we can. The, I, I think politicians, and I think a lot of scientists who are tied to certain institutions are probably in a position where they can't come out and say what you can say because can you imagine a politician saying listen we got about a hundred years and it's a mess so uh, do you know that is that is that a, a good thing or a bad thing that the community can't say that or, or at least side with you I agree with you absolutely it's not only politicians the scientists can't because most scientists are employees of universities or governments and things and the next round of grant funding depends on saying the right thing. If they start saying alarming things like that they're, they're likely to be in trouble. So there's a great limitation on everybody on what they can say freely and yes it's a very powerful influence. Who funds you that, that allows you to do this? I fund myself you fund by yourself? writing books and by inventing things. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what, okay. Without giving away the patent, obviously, what's the thing you've invented that we need that's coming down the pipe that we're going to be very excited about? Oh, well, I mean, it was invented a long time ago as a thing called the electron capture detector. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of provided the data that, that made Rachel Carson's story true, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the world was getting damaged by pesticides and things. And it's been around a long time. I don't own the patent for that. The U.S. government took it. Nice. Is that still, is that Without my permission. Is it really? <laughs> Can, do, you, do you find people in governments that are willing to listen to you and take what you say seriously? Because obviously what, what you say, there are a lot of people in the scientific community who, who might agree with you, but a lot of people say no. They, dis they disagree. Do you find people in government that can agree with you? Very much so, yes. Uh, I, I think politicians have a lousy job. I mean, somebody said it's the art of the possible is politics. Yeah. And uh, no, I, I think they're always willing to listen. But whether they can do anything is another matter. Uh, in terms of energy, so people are talking about how do you find renewable energy sources, uh, wind power, solar power, whatever. For you do, you, do you look at it and say, what's now understanding that is over anyway? Is there a place we should be focusing our attention on? Well, it's a matter of horses for courses. If you live in Iceland, you've got all the energy you need from hot rocks and stuff, so why bother with nuclear or anything else? If you live in Britain, you haven't any option. It's an overcrowded little island. You've either got the choice of burning fossil fuel coal or of going nuclear. Well, I think it's much better to go nuclear for mm -hmm. Britain. Uh, renewables are a joke. I mean, they will not supply uh, anywhere near enough energy at all. But they're very, very good for business. You can make a lot of money going into renewable energy. So how do you... So the environmentalists don't like you very much, do they? No. <laughs> <laughs> is there a chance you're wrong in your, in your mind? Of course there is. I'm a scientist and you can never be certain about anything. Mm -hmm. And you wonder better really realise that. None of us can be certain. So I figured that you must have really believed in what you're saying because you're going to space and I thought maybe you're going to try to colonize. Um, <laughs> are, you, are you on the Richard Branson flight? Is that the, apparently you're on that flight? Yeah, it's the ultimate upgrade, isn't it? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> how, how, uh, how did you get on the Richard Branson flight? 
Well, I guess Richard, Sir Richard Branson read some of my books and seemed to like what he heard, and he sent me an email saying, would I like to have a free ride up into space? So I said, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> did he try to name something? Did he try to take your name, the Gaia Theory, or something, use Gaia to launch a product or something? Uh, I think he did, and I, uh, I did email him beforehand saying, no, that was biofuels. Biofuels. And I don't think they're a good idea at all, and I said, no objection to his using biofuels, but don't go and tie Gaia to it, because yeah. it isn't a Gaian idea. It's amazing. You've got to read this book. It's called The Vanishing Face of Gaia. James Lovelock, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs> James Lovelock. All right, we'll be right back.